Now, as we'll see throughout this course, cognitive psychologists use a variety of research methods to answer all these questions about cognition. Probably most commonly, you'll see lab-based experiments where a variable is manipulated, say by putting people in an experimental group and a control group, and then we measure some outcome variable. But a lot of cognitive psychologists are more focused on techniques that involve in some way measuring something about the brain, maybe piecing together the, the link between brain processes and cognitive processes. Sometimes that information can come from like an autopsy after someone's died and look what you know was going on in their brain. But much more common nowadays is live imaging of human brains, seeing the living brain in action. So when we study people with uh, brain damage, for example, that specialty is called neuropsychology, or sometimes we might image or scan the brains of healthy people doing just various cognitive tasks. And that's what we call cognitive neuroscience. We'll dive deeper into those techniques in an upcoming topic. Now, we can also get more invasive by using animal models, either through damaging or, or genetically modifying the brains of animals to see how their behavior and their cognition changes. This is kind of the overlap between cognitive neuroscience and behavioral neuroscience. But you'll find that most cognitive psychologists who study the brain, they're doing it with human participants rather than non-human animals. So most of what we'll be seeing in cognitive psychology, if they're looking directly at brain stuff, would be in cognitive neuroscience or maybe sometimes with um, patients' case studies from neuropsychology. Of course, some cognitive psychology studies that are, are incorporating self-report data kind of to help understand thought and action. But as I've already hinted at, us humans, we're not always accurate in our metacognition. That is, we're not always correct about our own thinking or why we did what we did. And often we, you know, we're overconfident about our memories or our decision making. So often cognitive psychologists might avoid self-report altogether. Uh, or add other measures, because we, we might want to try and infer cognitive processes by measuring other direct behavior, not just self-report. Now, some of what we know about cognition comes initially from case studies. You may be familiar with like the famous Phineas Gage, a railroad worker in the 1800s who had an iron rod shoot through part of his frontal lobe, passed out the other side of his brain, after which his behavior and his personality drastically changed. Like in some sense, who he was was different after something changed about his brain, leading to a lot of hypotheses about the functions of the frontal lobe and, and the brain in general. And that's classic neuropsychology. But we also learn about things like psycholinguistics, the psychology of language, by studying cases like Jeannie, uh, a famous um, so-called feral child who had suffered some really severe neglect and isolation, basically hadn't learned language, hadn't been around people, and her case helped us understand language development. And it contributed to debates at the time about whether language is innate or whether we have a critical period of development after which someone can't pick up a language if they haven't done so yet. So we can learn some very basic science things about how language works, about how the brain works by studying individual cases that may have gone through some extreme um, situations. Sometimes you also see psychologists studying cognition using naturalistic observation, like just observing the problem solving processes among engineers in a factory or collecting kind of field data unobtrusively. Now the downside here compared to the experimental method is that the data is correlational at best. So we have to be kind of careful about making causation claims from this kind of study, though it can often help us develop hypotheses, right? Figure out if it's worth investing further in a topic using more expensive experimental methods. Finally, some psychologists use computer simulations and computer modeling to answer questions that are cognitive, or maybe even study and develop computing systems themselves, like with artificial intelligence. In other words, cognition or cognitive-like processes in digital computers, maybe to compare to humans. So these are a lot of the main methods used by cognitive psychologists. Not, not all of them, but a lot of them. But before we end, I want to see a, a couple quick examples of these kind of things. So here's a popular press report from a 2016 study that used naturalistic observation. So as you can see, just in the highlighted bit, if you skim down here, a team of researchers recorded hundreds of interactions between diners and waiting staff at 50 restaurants. Okay, that's naturalistic observation. And in this case, they found that people's eating choices seem to be affected by the BMI of their waiter or waitress, basically ordering more dessert and more alcoholic drinks if they have higher BMI, I'm sure you can already think of some confounds here that may actually bring these results into question, but cheap and easy studies like these can often provide the groundwork for more controlled experimental studies later. 
Similarly, self-report from a survey might be used to study something like, say, lucid dreaming, maybe to pinpoint some correlations that offer hints at the variables that should be studied further, right? It can help us rule out some hypotheses and maybe build others so that you don't waste hundreds of thousands of dollars doing really expensive sleep studies in a lab before you've actually figured out the relevant variables that you want to manipulate and measure. So self-report data can be very valuable, some of these things initially just for kind of building our, our basic understanding before we get to the more controlled lab studies and experiments. And here's an example in this video of neuropsychology. So you're gonna see him asking this patient here about her experience she's been having since her recent stroke. You'll actually notice half of her body is, is paralyzed this kind of uh, hemiparesis, it's fairly common in a stroke, it's often temporary, but from that alone, we actually know something about how the stroke affected her brain because it tells us the stroke hit her left hemisphere. Why? Because the right half of her body is paralyzed. And we know that brains are wired contralaterally, meaning opposite side, meaning the left half of the brain controls the right half of the body and vice versa. The right half of the brain controls the left half of the body. But in this case, the neuropsychologist will be asking about some additional symptoms she's having. So let's see what she went through. All right, so can you tell me, ma'am, what's been going on with this left hand? Yeah, the past couple of days, mm -hmm. um, my left hand has been doing involuntary movements that have been kind of surprising to the rest of my body. Mm -hmm. And tell me, I see it's moving now. Yes. Are you making that happen or is it doing it on its own? It's doing it on its own. Okay. And can you lift that arm in the air for me? Yes, I can. Give it a try. Good. Great. Put it back down. Now, tell me, the other day you told me that there was an interesting uh, thing that happened with your hair. Tell me about that. Yes, that was earlier today, actually. I was just laying in bed and the nurses were coming around and asking how things were going. And things, I was saying, well things are fine if I could just figure out who was pulling at my hair. Because that hurts. And who was pulling at your hair? And they said, well, you, you're, you need to let go of your hair. So uh, my left hand was apparently pulling at my own head. And you didn't know that? And I didn't know that, I didn't realize it. And so, so she's showing what's called anarchic hand sign. Basically, one of her arms is doing things without her control. It doesn't feel like she's initiating or choosing those actions. Her, her hand just kind of has a quote unquote mind of its own. And that's, that's really going to bother you, right? As a, as a person, you usually expect to have control of your body. So this is a, this is a weird symptom. You see it sometimes um, with people who've had a stroke to a certain part of the brain. And so we can connect that symptom or that sign to, to like a CT or an MRI scan to learn what parts of the brain may be involved in basic things like our sense of self or the, the sense of ownership and agency for your own body and its actions. So when something goes wrong in the brain, we often learn a lot about the, the tasks that the brain is doing behind the scenes all the time. Even something as fundamental as making you feel as if you're in control of your own movements. So that's an example of how neuropsychology can help us get a grasp, no pun intended, on some of the basic aspects of cognition or, or consciousness. Meanwhile, a cognitive neuroscience study might look more like this one here, where they put healthy kids in an MRI scanner, but it's set up to measure functional activity in the brain, basically measuring brain activity during a basic cognitive task like doing math. So you can see an example of a simple math problem at the top here. 7x plus 1 equals 29. So you just have to solve for what x is. So what we might do in a study like this is, as an independent variable, we might manipulate the type of math problem being given to them from a simple one-step problem to a harder two or three-step math problem, or maybe as a control, even a basic zero-step problem that's basically just recognition without any calculation needed. So we have them do these different types of math problems and we scan their brain during the task to try and establish how the brain carries out that cognitive task. We might see their visual cortex light up first as they look at and perceive the numbers and the symbols. Then maybe areas further into their brain after that may be active as they retrieve the meaning of certain symbols and retrieve the steps needed to solve this kind of problem based on their past learning. 
Then they might direct their eyes back to gather more info and then do some more processing until eventually they have the answer and they can send a signal out from the brain as a motor command, telling the mouth to say four or the finger to press the four key once they've solved it. And again, we're measuring how much time that took, right? There's our reaction time there, but we can get beyond just the reaction time of how long it took to solve it. We might be able to use the brain scan information to understand what's going on, the kind of intervening or intermediate steps that are going on, the cognition that led to that response. And while they do all that, we're watching their brain, right? We're, we're seeing the time course of activity, maybe in some different areas. And in the, the control condition, right, the zero step control condition, that's the darkest line on each of these graphs, you might see that the activity happens quicker. And also, if you look in that bottom left graph, the, the, in the frontal area of the brain, there's not much activity for the zero step, the control condition. But in the harder condition, solving a two-step math problem, that's the lightest line on each of these graphs, we might see the peak is later, and also the peak is larger in like the parietal lobe and also there in the frontal areas. Basically, without getting too far into the details of this one particular study and its hypotheses, the point from an example like this right now is just that in cognitive neuroscience, we can use imaging, brain imaging, like fMRI or PET scans or EEG, to watch the living brain in action in such a way that we can figure out some of the specifics of how thinking is carried out, of how cognition happens. And for a long time in the past century, behaviorists were actually dominant in psychology departments across the country, especially going into the mid-1900s. And many of them argued that, that what happens in the mind is basically something we can't study scientifically. That it's basically a black box we can never directly observe, so science shouldn't pay attention to it. Psychology shouldn't study the mental, right? We should just study input and output. We should study stimulus and response. Mental events aren't directly measurable. Just the environmental stimuli, the inputs, and, and the behavior we see from a creature as outputs. And while we might not be able to measure mental events themselves, we can, we now see, systematically measure and manipulate their they're correlates in a way that helps us to infer how mentalizing works, to peek into the black box indirectly. It doesn't have to be a mystery or something that science can't touch. And that's what cognitive psychologists are interested in. Now, most cognitive psychology studies don't involve a brain scanner like an fMRI that can cost many hundreds of dollars per participant that you run. Even just for like a half hour run on an fMRI with one participant, that can be hundreds and hundreds of dollars. So many more studies than that are done in a simple laboratory, often on a computer, where we can tightly control the, the presentation and the timing of stimuli and record a person's responding, including their reaction time, with extreme accuracy. So here's an example of what a cognitive psychology experiment on a topic of attention might look like. So it says, but during each trial, you'll be listening to do sequences of sounds. During the first sequence, you'll hear one bird chirp, which is the target, two neutral computer tones, which are neutral, and one dog bark, which is a distractor. During the second sequence, you'll hear one chirp, the target, and three computer tones, which are neutral. After each sequence of four sounds, you'll be shown a question mark. As fast as possible, please indicate which sound was the chirp. Was the chirp the first, second, third, or fourth sound in the sequence? To make your response, you'll use the one, two, three, and four keys. So this is to familiarize you with the sound. So this is the chirp. Okay. This is the bark. This is the computer tone. And here's a sequence. So now, during the sequence, that chirp was in the second position, so you would um, press the two key, right? Because you're listening for the chirp. Then in addition to the sounds, you get background noise and background pictures. So the background noise could be the city, that's like city noise, or it could be ocean, waves. Honestly, I don't think they sound that different, but they come with the picture, so it helps you identify it. So I'm just going to go ahead. Okay. Okay. Sorry, E. So did the context match or not? They did not. Four. Okay, oh, that was the practice. Okay. Now there oh. are actually like, 80 something trials. So you try it. Now, 
Of course, the methods we've talked about, they're, they're not mutually exclusive. So the fMRI study of kids doing math in a brain scanner, that also used an experimental design where, in that case, they manipulated the type or the complexity of math problem as an independent variable while measuring brain activity as a dependent variable. Likewise, with neuropsychology patients who have brain damage, we might also do single subject experiments with them where we take that person and we, we test them in different conditions to better understand what's going on. Likewise, um, a cognitive psych study might collect self-report data in addition to behavioral measures like reaction time and accuracy. So we might also ask the kids to describe out loud how they solve a math problem in addition to measuring how quickly they solve it and looking at their brain while they do it. So these methods I've mentioned here aren't mutually exclusive, nor are they exhaustive of all methods in cognitive psych, but this gives you a feel for the kinds of things we'll see throughout this course. And by far the most common kind of study we'll see is an experimental design kind of akin to this last video we just saw here. So let's end this by, by just briefly introducing a few terms relevant to experimental design, uh, and this may be review for you. Uh, but in, in experiments, we manipulate what's called an independent variable, or IV. So in a medical study, the independent variable might be whether they got the drug we're testing or an inert placebo. So right, whether you're in the drug group or the control group, that's the independent variable. In a cognitive study, the independent variable comes from whatever hypothesis it is that we're testing, right? Often based on some overarching theory we have for how memory works or how attention works or how perception works. And, and we're, we're kind of just trying to nail down some specific question, test some specific hypothesis about one aspect of that. Now, in experiments, we generally will, will randomly assign subjects to different levels of the independent variable. Sometimes there are only two levels of the IV, like the experimental group and the control group. Those are the two levels. Or in a medical study, the drug group and the placebo group. Those are two levels of the IV. But other times we might have five levels of the independent variable where we split our participants up into five groups, five different conditions that we compare. The important thing is by randomly assigning people to groups, we ensure that all the groups start out roughly the same on all variables, even all the possible confounding variables that we never would have thought to check. So we start with groups that are exactly the same or you know, roughly the same in pretty much every possible way. So at the start of the study, there's no difference between them. So that the only difference between those groups will be our manipulation. The variable we're testing, the IV, will be the only difference between them. That way, if, if we end up finding different accuracy or a faster reaction time or different patterns of brain activity in one of those groups during our experiment, we know that the only explanation could be the independent variable, the thing we manipulated. Meanwhile, during the experiment, we have to be careful not to introduce new extraneous variables, new confounds, new you know, differences between the groups beyond the IV that we're manipulating. So we try to hold everything else about the subject's experience common across the different groups. This is why we might do most of our testing in a laboratory where we have tight control over the circumstances. So everyone sits in the same seat. Everyone's in the same room doing the study with the same colored walls in the background and the same room temperature. Everyone uses the same computer, perhaps even on a chin rest so that we know everyone's eyes are exactly the same distance from the monitor. We control all those little extraneous variables so that as much as possible, the only difference is the independent variable that we're testing. Then we measure some dependent variable or perhaps multiple dependent variables like we might collect accuracy rate, but also reaction time. And perhaps we can also, you know, study heart rate or measure cortisol levels or skin conductance, or we might use eye tracking to compare where people look and for how long we're comparing different conditions that we're doing or if we're studying attention, things like that. So there are lots of things you'll see, but you know, we, we're manipulating one variable, the independent variable, and then measuring something else as a dependent variable. But that's a good place to stop for now. In the next couple of videos, what we're going to do is a brief tour. I know this stuff can be kind of boring, but it's, it's brief compared to the, to the relative history of psychology. We're going to do a brief tour of where cognitive psych comes from as a field and kind of how the, the cognitive revolution naturally evolved out of some competing schools of thought historically.